we will be getting started momentarily. Good afternoon. I'm Jennifer Lowe. I'm the Director of Programs and Strategic Planning for the Supreme Court Historical Society. I'm delighted to welcome you to our virtual platform for today's program with Justice Mark Dillon. One of the good things to come out of the global COVID pandemic was the Society's ability to bring virtual programs to our members around the country and not just those here in Washington, D.C. I hope you have found them to be valuable and we have no plans to stop doing them. Today, we are joined by Justice Mark Dillon. He is a justice of the New York State Supreme Court, currently serving in its appellate division in the second judicial department. He was elected to the Supreme Court in the state's ninth judicial district in 1999 before his appointment to the appellate division by Governor George Pataki in 2005. He was reappointed to be one of the senior to one of the senior constitutional seats at the appellate division by Governor David Patterson in January 2009. Justice Dillon has presided in a variety of courts, including the trial parts of the Supreme Courts in Westchester, Rockland, and Dutchess counties, the Westchester County Court, and the Yorktown Justice Court. His experience on the bench totals more than 19 years. He holds a BA from Colgate University, an MA from New York University, and a JD from the Fordham University School of Law. He is the author of The First Chief Justice, John Jay and the Struggle of a New Nation, from which today's talk is drawn. We will be taking questions from the audience, and you can share your questions in the Q&A box on your Zoom window somewhere on the bottom in the middle. Justice Dillon, the floor is yours. Well, good afternoon, and, and thank you, Jennifer, for the uh, introduction, and thank you to the Historical Society for this privilege to be able to uh, make this presentation and, and to address your, your members and others that have tuned in. Um, it's appropriate, perhaps, that we're having this program this week, because just two days ago, we had President's Day, and we're celebrating the birth of George Washington, and we know that President Washington was the one that appointed John Jay to be the first Chief Judge of the United States Supreme Court. Uh, I uh, say sometimes tongue-in-cheek that John Jay is the founding father from New York that does not have a popular Broadway musical program named after him. But uh, if anybody wants to consider writing the score for that, please please feel free. Uh, we're going to have basically four segments to the discussion today. One is I'll talk in a general sense about John Jay's life and biography leading up to his appointment to the Supreme Court. And then we'll we'll talk about uh, the uh, significant cases that he handled while on the Supreme Court. And then the third thing we have are some images that I can put on the share screen of, of some interesting people, places, and things. And then, of course, the Q and A that uh, that you had mentioned, Jennifer. So John Jay was born in. December, uh, December 12th of 1745 in Lower Manhattan, uh, part of Manhattan that's uh, near the, the famous Trinity Church, uh, near Wall Street, near the Battery. He, he was um, born into a prominent family, particularly on his mother's side. She was uh, a Phillips. She was a Van Cortland. Her father, Peter, was a successful merchant and he basically made his money trading between the United States and uh, Great Britain. Um, John was the eighth of 10 children born into the family. The family was Episcopalian. And not too long after John Jay was born, the father decided he was going to retire and move the family to a 400-acre piece of property in Rye, New York, which is in the southeast quadrant of Westchester County, north of New York City. When he retired, he was owed 4,000 British pounds by uh, some individuals that he had done business worth with. It's a little difficult to determine how much that's worth in today's dollars, but 
but there are methods and it's it, it's worth roughly 1.1 million dollars that he was owed which went a lot longer back in those days than 1.1 million would go today he used the courts over the next three to four years to recover most of that money and it was instructive to to jay as jay got older and knew the story of how the courts enabled his father to recover most of what was owed to him jay went to a boarding school in nearby new rochelle and at the age of 15, he enrolled in King's College, which we now know to be Columbia University, though it was at a different campus. There were no dedicated law schools yet. So to become a lawyer, which Jay wanted to do, you interned for an established attorney. And in Jay's case, he did intern for a very well-established, respected, successful, good lawyer by the name of Benjamin Kassam. There was no bar exam that John Jay was required to take, but Kassam vouched to the other attorneys in New York at the time that Jay was a worthwhile addition to the profession. And as a result, he was admitted to practice law on October 26th of 1768. This was pre-Revolutionary War, of course. And he opened a law practice with his college roommate, Robert Livingston. Uh, Livingston, you, you, you know the name. He, he was, among other things, the individual that wrote the preamble to the Declaration of Independence later in, in his life. The first office that they had for the practice of law, and we might find this very strange by today's standards, but, but Livingston's father was a judge uh, in the Colonial Supreme Court for New York, and they, they used judges' chambers as their, their law office. The idea of, of appearances of impropriety were, were a bit looser back then than they are by today's standards. Jay was a trial lawyer. Everybody back in those days was a general practitioner. He handled a variety of matters such as evictions, contract matters, assaults, defamation, overdue wages. And it, it, the practice had the effect Effect of bridging Jay's very patrician privileged life on the one hand with the pedestrian issues that faced the common folk on the other. And I, I got the sense in researching his life that he was very comfortable with everybody. By 1774, after practicing five or six years, he had become most likely the most successful attorney in the state of New York. One of the clients that he had was he was appointed to be the recording secretary for a boundary commission that was working out a border dispute between the, between New York and New Jersey. And things worked out, the, the issues were resolved, but it helped teach Jay early in his legal career the value of negotiation and diplomacy, which would be a, a major part of his life later. In 1774, he married 17-year-old Sarah Livingston. He returned from his honeymoon, which was to the Hudson Valley, and learned upon returning about the Boston Tea Party. He had shown no interest in politics up to that point, but being the prominent lawyer that he was, he had been invited to participate in a committee that wrote a letter on behalf of New Yorkers to the people of Boston, uh, supporting them in their efforts up there. And he didn't realize it at the time, but that event in his life sucked him into politics in a way that he would not escape for decades later. I'm going to give you a list of things that he did in furtherance of public service. And the theme here is that all of the things he did, he never sought them for himself. These are things that he would be asked by others to do, and he did them. He was a go-to guy when you needed something done and needed something done right. So he was asked in the fall of 1774 to go to Philadelphia, where he was a participant at the First Continental Congress in September and October of that year. He was 28 years old. He was the second youngest member of the First Continental Congress, and he was a significant author of a document that was known as an address to the people of Great Britain. In 1776, while the Revolutionary War was underway, he was, he was of course, back in New York, and he was appointed to head an intelligence or organization that was to spy on British troops and on loyalists 
And in the process, he was one of the people that uncovered a plot that was believed to have wanted to assassinate General George Washington in the field. Some arrests were made of conspirators. Uh, one individual was uh, executed as a result of that plot. After the, the uh, independence was declared in 1776, Jay became the principal drafter of what became New York's first constitution, which was ratified in 1777. Once the constitution was ratified on the state level, state positions had to be filled. Jay was appointed to be the first chief judge of the state of New York, and he served in that capacity for about a year and a half. His court and all the state government was on the run because the British troops were always, were always present and after, all, always after uh, the leaders in, in New York. About a year and a half into his service as chief judge, the state legislature asked John Jay to go to the Second Continental Congress, which was meeting in Philadelphia. And the purpose of that travel was to get Congress to help New York resolve um, the problem they were having with these people up in the Green Mountains, these rabble rousers that wanted to have independence in a state called Vermont. So uh, Jay goes down to the Continental Congress the president of the Continental Congress at the time was Henry Lorenz. The next day, Lorenz resigns. The Continental Congress needed a new president, and guess who gets it? Uh, John Jay was nominated, and he was elected by a vote of eight states to four. He served in that capacity for about a year, and because of the Revolutionary War and the importance of Spain as a potential ally or ally, he was asked to become our minister to Spain. He and his wife, Sarah, traveled by ship, of course, to Madrid, and he spent three years as minister to Spain. After the Battle of Yorktown and the defeat of General Cornwallis, Jay was asked by the Continental Congress to go to Paris and help negotiate the Treaty of Paris, along with Ben Franklin and John Adams, and Henry Lorenz, although Lorenz had been captured by the British and didn't have any major role in negotiations for most of the time. Uh, Adams was late getting to Paris. Franklin was suffering some, from some physical ailments. So Jay was really carrying the whole ball for quite some time. Uh, they ended up negotiating this treaty, which officially ended the Revolutionary War on terms that were very, very favorable to the United States and wildly popular with the people in the States when they learned of those terms. So when he came home from Paris in 1784, he was a rock and roll star. If there had been a, a public opinion poll like we do nowadays of, of Adams and Franklin and, and Jay, you know, the, the numbers would have been through the roof. We think of Jay today as being in the second tier of founding fathers, but, but back in the 1780s, uh, he wasn't a second-tier guy. He was very, very much in the first tier. He intended to return to the practice of law at that point. But when he came off the boat in New York after the treaty, he learned that the Continental Congress had appointed him to be the Minister of Foreign Affairs for the states during the Articles of Confederation. So he served in that capacity in Manhattan for five years, his office was upstairs in France's Tavern, which is uh, still in business today. It began in 1762, but it's still open for business today. And as we know, the, the Articles of Confederation didn't work out all that well. Uh, we needed more of a continentalist constitution. Jay helped sell the proposed federal constitution to New Yorkers. And among those efforts included his authorship of some of the Federalist Papers, along with John uh, uh, James Madison and Alexander Hamilton. When the Constitution was ratified by enough states, George Washington needed to fill the top positions. He needed to fill them with people that were known and credible. Jay, of course, had the nas national stature that Washington was looking for, and Jay was asked to be the nation's first chief judge. Now, that fit pretty well with Jay's background. Jay had been a lawyer. He had been the chief judge of the state of New York. Uh, he was known and um, credible to the American public. He had worked for the passage of the Constitution in the state of New York. 
And there might be that other matter of, of Jay having perhaps saved George Washington's life during the Revolutionary War. That might have counted for something too. But in any event, John Jay becomes chief judge. He's 44 years old. And in our nation's history to this day, he is the youngest person to ever become chief judge of the state of New York. He was on the Supreme Court from the fall of 89 until June 29th of 1795. The last year of his tenure as chief judge, he was in England. Uh, he was negotiating what we now know as the Jay Treaty at the request of George Washington. He didn't want to go, but he felt out of a sense of duty and having been asked that he needed to go, and he did. And when he returned from England after the Jay Treaty, he found that uh, he had been surprised. He had been elected governor of the state of New York. He was elected actually to two three-year terms as governor. Um, and it was being elected to governor, which brought about his resignation as chief judge of the US Supreme Court. So throughout his public life, through and including his years as governor, he, he never sought anything. He would be drafted to do things. He would be asked to do things. He would do it. He didn't seek fame. He certainly made a lot less money than he could have if he had simply remained an attorney he had no ambition for the presidency like some others, you know, John Adams, a fellow Federalist who, who wanted very much to succeed George Washington. If you're interested in a great general biography of the life of John Jay, the best one out there is called John Jay, Founding Father, uh, written by Walter Starr, S-T-A-H-R. It was published, I think, in 05, but there was a, a reissuance of it in 2017. My book is, is a little different than Walter Starr's because my focus was the Supreme Court years. There's some biography that has to be wrapped around that, of course, but the focus of my book is, is the uh, years on Supreme Court. So let's talk a little bit about that court and Jay's role in it. The early federal court system was in some ways similar, in some ways dissimilar to what we have today. There were district courts, each state was a district. Each district had one federal district court judge. There were circuit courts above that. They had appellate jurisdiction over the district courts, but they also had original jurisdiction, meaning that uh, they were trial level courts. If you had uh, cases involving citizens of different states, what lawyers call diversity of citizenship, and a case in controversy of, of, of uh, $500 or more. There were three circuits. There was an Eastern Circuit, which was New England and New York State. There was a Southern Circuit, which was Virginia and everything on South. And there was a Middle Circuit with everything in between. There was also a Supreme Court above that, consisting of six Supreme Court judges. Now, normally you'd think an appellate court should have an odd number of judges, so there'd be a tie-breaking vote, seven judges, nine judges like today. But, but the reason that the original um, procedures called for six judges was because geographically you'd have two Supreme Court judges from each of the three circuits, equaling six. The Supreme Court would sit twice a year, the full month of February and the full month of August. The rest of the year, the Supreme Court judges would ride the circuits. They would sit as members of what was originally three judge circuit court panels, two Supreme Court judges, plus the district court judge of the state from which the appeal comes up to the appellate court. There were no dedicated Supreme Court judges, uh, the circuit court judges, only the district courts and the Supreme Court judges that were acting in a, a circuit court capacity. Now, this should, should show you uh, on its face an anomaly, a problem. And it was a problem that wasn't fixed until 1891. That if you lose a case at the circuit court and two Supreme Court judges vote against you, let's say, in that three panel judge case, and you want to now appeal to the Supreme Court. Two of the six Supreme Court judges have already ruled against you on the circuit level. 
a 3-3 tie at the Supreme Court, you don't win. You need four judges on your side from a six-judge court, which means mathematically you would need to get four out of the four remaining judges on the Supreme Court, or you would have to convince one or two of those judges that sat on the circuit court that their decision was wrong and they should change their minds. Lawyers and litigators can understand that if you're sitting a client down and you're talking about whether to appeal and what are the odds of winning and how much will it cost and so on and so forth, imagine the conversations back in the 1790s if you had lost in a circuit court and you're deciding whether to go to the Supreme Court, the, the mathematical odds of winning are stacked against the appellant. Being on the circuits as Supreme Court judges was a rough life. You had to travel around the country. We didn't have the kind of roads we have nowadays. You were traveling in all sorts of weather, in the rain, in the snow, in the brutal heat. There were no Marriott's. Um, there were no air-conditioned vehicles. The food was hit or miss. The inns that you would stay in were hit or miss. Some might be good, some might not so. But in the inns in those days, you often shared rooms with total strangers, even beds with total strangers. And if you were a traveling Supreme Court judge riding the circuit, your travel expenses came out of your own pocket. Jay maintained a diary uh, during these years, and it's it's... It's telling how he, he hardly ever talked about any of his cases in his diaries, almost never, but he did talk about the inns that he liked or disliked and the food that he encountered there. During the time that John Jay was on the Supreme Court hearing Supreme Court cases, he, he only saw 11 cases. Three of them, Brailsford was the same case. It came, it came back a second time, it came back a third time. So if you count that as one, there were really only nine cases. And of those nine cases, th three were such minor inconsequential matters. They really don't merit much attention. So that really leaves six cases that are of great significance to the time that John Jay was on the court. And I'd like to turn now to three of those six cases. The first one, in fact, the first case that was ever argued at the United States Supreme Court was West versus Barnes, has a very, very interesting background that we don't have time to go into about the Rhode Island state currency laws, which contributed to the dispute that rose, arose between the appellant, William West, and the respondent, um, Barnes. When the appellant, West, who had lost at the circuit court, wanted to appeal his case to the Supreme Court, he had to file what was known as a writ of error. It's a document similar to what we today call a notice of appeal, but it had the additional um, role of directing that the file of the court be transferred from that lower court to the higher court that would be hearing the appeal. The Judiciary Act of 1789 had a provision in section 14 that the writ of error was to be fi filed, and I'm going to quote here, as necessary for the execution of their respective jurisdictions and agreeable to the principles and usages of law, close quote. What that really meant and what the, what the real understanding was of it and the practice and the traditions was that if you were filing a writ of error, you filed it with the higher court that you were appealing to rather than with the lower court that you were appealing from. Why? Because only higher courts can tell lower courts what to do, such as to transfer the court file from one court to the other. And further, the Judiciary Act provided that the writ of error needed to be filed with the higher court within 10 days of the decision or order being appealed from. In William West's case, living up in Skituate, Rhode Island, it was really a physical impossibility for him to be able to meet the requirements of that law and get a writ of error filed in Philadelphia, where the court was by then sitting. So when William West's lawyer, he hired in, in uh, Philadelphia, uh, Attorney General William Bradford, uh, even though Bradford was Attorney General, he was allowed to have private clients. Bradford showed up to argue the case in court. The respondent, David Leonard Barnes, came down from Massachusetts 
to argue on his behalf that was the diversity of citizenship, Rhode Island and Massachusetts. And just at the beginning of oral argument, right off the bat, John Jay says to Bradford, representing the appellant, um, we don't have a writ of error. We certainly don't have one filed in 10 days. Do we have jurisdiction to entertain this case? And this kicks off something that we all know as lawyers and judges very well, that courts will first look at the procedural hurdles of a case, and only if a party can get past a procedural hurdle do you then look at the merits and decide the merits. Clearly, the judiciary law, with its 10-day filing rule, made no sense. It was horribly unfair to anybody that lived distant from Philadelphia, particularly you know, Georgia, New Hampshire, in this case, Rhode Island. But the, the Supreme Court ruled by a six to nothing vote that the court was without jurisdiction to hear the case. And no matter how unfair that result was to William West in not being able to present the merits of his case to the Supreme Court, the result of, this, of West versus Barnes was a broader principle. The six judges on the Supreme Court, including Jay, reasoned that Congress is who writes the law. Courts are the ones who apply the law. And if a law makes no sense, and if it needs to be amended, then it is the role of the legislature to do that, not the role of the court to disregard the language of legislation in order to reach a, a feel-good result. And imagine how our society would have developed differently if West versus Barnes had been decided the other way, where courts would have license to disregard legislative language and decide how, how cases should be resolved based just on what they wanted to do. There would be no predictability to our courts. There would be no legal precedence of any value. And attorneys would have a difficult time advising clients about how their cases should be expected to turn out. We take these principles for granted today, but in, in 1791, this decision was a big deal. How this case was going to turn out was a big question mark. And the court was, from this case forward, shaping Americanized law from scratch under a new constitution because there was no historical counterpart like ours that they could really draw upon. Another case that is historically noteworthy is In re Hayburn. This was the second case that, or second decision that the Supreme Court needed to, to decide. Uh, we have in the United States a very long history of taking care of veterans after war. And that, that actually began way back in the post-war, post-revolutionary war period. Congress passed in 1792 the Invalid Pension Act to provide pensions to war widows, to orphans, and to disabled veterans. The legislation that Congress enacted called upon the judges of the United States Supreme Court while riding the circuits to act as pension commissioners. As pension commissioners, they would meet with and evaluate the injured veterans and determine the percentages of their disabilities. The percentages of their disabilities would affect the amount of pension that each individual would re receive from the government. The judge's assessments were subject to review by the Secretary of War, Henry Knox, and ultimately by Congress. This law raised a, a host of nightmarish constitutional problems. Uh, there was, for instance, no case in controversy that the judges were being asked to decide. And constitutionally, nothing subjected the judiciary to the oversight of the executive or legislative branches. All the judges of the Supreme Court either publicly or privately believed that this law was unconstitutional. Jay kept it private, others not so much. Jay understood that the law accomplished a very laudable goal and purpose. And with his diplomatic background and experience, he, he sought and struggled to find a way to follow the law 
to act as a pension commissioner to get these individuals their pensions. And one way he did so was he would act as pension commissioner at the end of the workday after court had closed. And he did that to cooperate as much as he could with the will of Congress. But Jay's hands got forced in the spring of 1792. Jay was riding the, the, the Eastern Circuit when this law came online, but the Middle Circuit was um, being judged by uh, Supreme Court judges James Wilson and John Blair and by District Court Judge Richard Peters of Pennsylvania while they were riding the circuit in Pennsylvania. A pension applicant by the name of William Hayburn came to the Middle Circuit with a pension application and the judges there refused to entertain it. They said that the law was, quote, defective, close quote. They didn't say unconstitutional. They said defective. But, but in describing why it was defective, they were talking about unconstitutionality. They, they said that there was no case of controversy, and they said that uh, their decision would be subject to review by other branches of government. The public and the press and the government interpreted what they had, had decided as a declaration that the law was unconstitutional. There was even talk in Congress of impeaching the judges. The doctrine of judicial review had not yet been established. That wouldn't come until Marbury versus Madison in 1803. It was a very controversial and touchy subject. So Attorney General Edmund Randolph, acting on behalf of the pensioner or the proposed pensioner, William Hayburn, brought to the United States Supreme Court a writ of mandamus. That was in the August of 1792 term of the Supreme Court. And by that writ, he sought to compel the judges of the Middle Circuit to entertain the pension application under the 1792 law. This could only be decided on its merits, one way or the other, by determining whether to invoke judicial review 11 years prior to Marbury versus Madison. And clearly the votes were present to find that the law was unconstitutional, perhaps as many as six to zero if Jay went that way. But based upon the two judges' determination and circuit level and other writings from other judges, uh, it was clear that, that this law was well on its way to be struck down as unconstitutional. And Jay was desperate to avoid a circumstance where the judicial branch would strike down legislation passed by Congress, particularly something as laudable as this was. The nation was only in its third year of existence. It was potentially fragile. The Articles of Confederation hadn't worked out. The government was trying to establish its credibility with the public. The founders didn't know if this system was going to work at all. On the state level, there had been some instances where state courts had declared state legislation unconstitutional. But in those cases, the state's legislatures simply ignored the judiciary as if their determinations didn't mean anything or didn't matter. And Jay didn't want to prompt a constitutional crisis so early in the nation's life where the Supreme Court would hold that the Pension Act of Congress was unconstitutional. So he did something that was very shrewd and political, depending on your point of view. He adjourned the Hayburn matter that was being heard in August of 1792 to the February 1793 term of the court. Doing so provided Congress with the time to correct the constitutional infirmities of the pension law. And they did so, although they waited to the last minute, as Congress sometimes does. They waited until literally February 20, 28 of 1793, which was the last day of the court's February term. But they did then pass a Pension Act of 1793, which removed the arguably unconstitutional provisions from the prior law. And as a result, the writ of mandamus that had been brought on behalf of William Hayburn was rendered academic. The Supreme Court dodged the bullet of having to invoke the doctrine of judicial review. And by 1803, when Marbury versus Madison was decided, 
the, the you know the country had been better established. It was ten years later, eleven years later, and uh, the the political system was able to then withstand the shock of judicial review. The Hayburn decision itself is a little disappointing. It's half a page long. It really doesn't say anything. It doesn't tell the reader that uh, the Supreme Court skated close to the edge of the issue of judicial review. Anybody reading that decision would have no clue about the potential significance that the case might have played in our history. But the case is an example of how John Jay was a conciliator, a diplomat, how he cooperated with the other branches of government. He wasn't a bomb thrower. He finessed the court out of the situation that he wanted to get the court out of. He didn't get into the face of Congress. And it reflects perhaps that diplomatic background that he had developed while he was in Spain, while he was in Paris, and while he had been Minister of Foreign Affairs. The last of the three cases that I'd like to talk about today has to do with uh, Chisholm versus Georgia. This was 1793. You know, we have a competition between the originalist view of the Constitution versus the Constitution being a living, breathing document. Back in the 1790s, living, breathing document wasn't the thought in anybody's head. Everybody back in the 1790s were originalists. And we now today think of originalists of having two schools. There's one school, the Scalia school, the textualist school, the plain language that the Constitution says what it says and it doesn't say what it doesn't say. And then the other school is intent of the founders. Usually when the founders were drafting our, our founding documents, they would know their intent. They would take their quill pen and they would write it down and the text would reflect the intent. The Chisholm case that we're going to talk about is an instance where the intent was one thing and the plain language said something else. The Constitution says in Article 3, Section 2, that the federal courts would have jurisdiction to hear suits, quote, between a state and citizens of another state, close quote. And that was the original draft, which also was then ratified when the Constitution was ratified. People couldn't sue their own states because of sovereign immunity. But the question here is, can you, if you're in one state, can you sue another state in federal court? Well, when this language was drafted, the anti-federalists who believed in, in the greatest level of state rights and wanted to keep the federal, federal government out of the state's hair as much as possible, they complained about this language. They were apoplectic at the thought that states could be sued in federal court. They were okay if states were the plaintiff in federal court, but not as defendants. The states were, as a practical matter, bankrupt. And the last thing they wanted was for there to be a, a cascade of lawsuits against the states by creditors seeking to recover revolutionary war debts from those bankrupt states. Prominent federalists, such as James Madison and John Marshall and Alexander Hamilton, they agreed with the anti-federalists that states should not be subject to the jurisdiction of the federal courts. In fact, uh, Hamilton in Federalist Paper 81 addressed the issue. He said that if a state were in federal court and a judgment would, render, would be rendered that the state wouldn't honor, how would you enforce it? Would the federal government have to go to war against the state? He, he called that, quote, unwarrantable, close quote. So there was a gentleman's understanding between the, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists that the language that had been drafted for the Constitution meant that the federal courts would have jurisdiction over matters where states were plaintiffs, but not if they were defended, the defendants. But, but nobody ever went back and tweaked the language of the Constitution to make that clear. So the Constitution gets ratified. In Chisholm versus Georgia, Chisholm was a South Carolinian who sued Georgia for money that was owed for unpaid goods during the war. The case ultimately made it to the United States Supreme Court. And the judges then didn't realize it and couldn't realize it at the time, but the case was about whether they would read the constitutional language about jurisdiction 
under textualism or intent of the founders. And it was a 5-1 decision. John Jay was in the majority. The dissenting justice was James Iredell of North Carolina. The judges essentially decided that the plain language of the Constitution said what it said, that federal courts have jurisdiction in matters involving a state and citizens of another state. There was no carve out there for who was the plaintiff or who was the defendant. So they held that the state of Georgia, which was contesting the jurisdiction, was subject to it. And there was quite an uproar as a result of that decision. Governor John Hancock up in Massachusetts called his legislature into session to discuss what to do. There was a cavalcade of lawsuits being filed as a result of what had happened with Chisholm before it got to the Supreme Court. And um, Massachusetts had to decide whether or not it would yield to federal jurisdiction in a case called v Vassal, which had just been filed against it, or defy the United States Supreme Court. And he and the Massachusetts legislature chose to defy the Supreme Court. They refused to appear in the Vassal case, notwithstanding the fact that the Supreme Court of the United States said they were subject to jurisdiction. Not to be outdone, the Georgia legislature, the lower house, passed a bill on November 9th of 1793 in reaction to Chisholm, saying that if anybody from out of state dared sue them in a federal court, those individuals would be summarily arrested, hanged, and without benefit of clergy. That law didn't ultimately get enacted. And, and one of the reasons was because an effort was, was begun, with Massachusetts, to its credit, I guess, taking the lead, that there be an amendment to the Constitution. It became the 11th Amendment. It passed by the requisite number of states, the 75% of the states required in February of 1795. And it excluded the states from federal lawsuits. Now, in the meantime, lawsuits against the states were flooding the courts. And a question arose as to whether or not the 11th Amendment would be prospective only or retroactive. If prospective only, then all the suits that had come into the federal courts up to the 11th Amendment would still be viable. But if retroactive, then they would all have to be dismissed. That ended up going to the Supreme Court in another case, Hollingsworth versus Virginia. Now, this is 1798. John Jay was off the court. The chief judge was Oliver Ellsworth. And the court held that the 11th Amendment was retroactive because the 11th Amendment wasn't actually an amendment at all, even though it came into existence through the amendment procedures of the Constitution. It was instead merely a clarification of what the language of the Constitution meant, which raises the question, if, if it's a clarification of what the original Constitution meant, that is the school of originalism based on intent of the founders. Whereas the Chisholm case, that court rendered its decision based on plain text, plain language textualism. So you had two different Supreme Courts within a span of five years using originalism, but in two different ways to get to the results that they achieved. Which leads to a final observation before we take a quick look at some photos. If the 11th Amendment according to the Supreme Court in Hollingsworth, is not really an amendment, then are all the later amendments misnumbered by one? Is the 12th Amendment really the 11th? Is it like when you go into a tall hotel in the elevator and there's no button for the 13th floor? Well, we know there is a 13th floor. The 14th floor is the 13th floor. But I just throw that out there as, as a parting comment uh, about Chisholm and Hollingsworth. So I'm now going to Turn on my share screen. I'm sorry, wrong one. And pull up some uh, images of interesting people, places, and things. This is the photo of the house on the 400 acre property that was bought by John Jay's father 
in the late 1740s and where John Jay grew up. The building is no longer in existence. This is John Jay's father, Peter, the merchant. This is John Jay's law license that was issued in 1768. A couple of things that are noteworthy about it. If you look at the upper left-hand corner, you'll see a seal. That's how seals were created nowadays. I guess most of us on our diplomas, we have some, uh, some shiny goldish colored uh, material. Uh, this was raised paper. And there's also a uh, rope around it. Um, I am assuming that the purpose of this was so that you could hang it on a wall the way diplomas can be hanged on a wall today. Uh, this document is among the original J papers that are repository at the Butler Library of Columbia University in the west side of Manhattan. This is the oldest photograph that I could find of France's tavern in Lower Manhattan. It was within walking distance of where Jay was born. And it's the building where Jay maintained his office while uh, for much of the time that he was Minister of Foreign Affairs during the Articles of Confederation. This is a portrait of Sarah Livingston Jay, John Jay's wife. This is a portrait of Enoch Crosby. I didn't mention him so far. He is a spy. John Jay was his spy master. Crosby was uh, terrific at the job, finding out what the British troops and loyalists were up to. And decades later in 1821, James Fenimore Cooper wrote a book called The Spy, Tales from a Neutral Ground. It was based, the, the, the main character in that book was known as Harvey Birch, but it was based on this individual, Enoch Crosby. And John Jay was still alive that uh, James Fenimore Cooper spoke to John Jay about Crosby and provided a lot of the in information and inspiration that went into the book. Our next image is the certificate by which John Jay uh, was officially appointed chief judge of the state of New York, also at Columbia University. This, also at Columbia University, is a photograph of the original document by which John Jay was appointed to negotiate the Treaty of Paris with Great Britain. This is an unfinished portrait by a very famous artist named Benjamin West. It's of the negotiators of the Treaty of Paris. John Jay is standing to the left of the photo, and then going toward the right, you got John Adams, you got Ben Franklin, you have Henry, Henry Lorenz standing, and you have William Temple Franklin, who was the secretary to the group, the American delegation. You'll notice that the right side of the photograph is blank, and there appears to be a reason for that. The negotiators for Great Britain were Richard Oswald and Henry Strachey. They never showed up for their portrait. It's believed that they didn't do so because they didn't want their images to be memorialized in posterity, representing the losers of the Revolutionary War. Our next picture is of the original oath that was administered to John Jay when he became chief judge of the United States Supreme Court. This is John Jay's official portrait. The judges didn't have official regalia in those days. Jay did, however, receive an honorary degree from Harvard College, and this was the regalia he had been given by Harvard, so that's Harvard red in the photo. This is one of two of John Jay's bookcases. It's currently located at the Jay Homestead in Katona, New York. When Jay would travel with his books, when he was riding the circuit and hearing Supreme Court matters, he had to take his books. These compartments come off, but the design is such that if you take each compartment and put it on its back with the glass swing doors facing up, you don't have to take the books out. There are handles on each side and you could carry the compartments to a carriage and then reassemble the bookcase at the destination. Uh, that's how they traveled. We still use this design in courts and in law offices, though without the side handles. Now, this is a photograph of a drawing of 
the Royal Exchange Building in Lower Manhattan, where the United States Supreme Court held its very first session on February 1st of 1790. This is an image of David Leonard Barnes, who is the successful arguer at the first ever case decided by the Supreme Court, West versus Barnes. This is an image of the courtroom that has been preserved at Old City Hall in Philadelphia next to Independence Hall. When the Capitol moved from New York to Philadelphia, the Supreme Court sat there very often. You'll notice that there are six chairs for the six judges that were on the Supreme Court at the time. And I'll just leave you with one last photograph. That is the John Jay Homestead where he spent the latter half or so of his life in Katona, New York. It is open to the public. It is run by the state and is available for tours and other events. So Jennifer, if there are any questions, we can we can uh, tap into those now. Terrific, thank you so much. Uh, we do have a couple questions and there's still time to add more to the Q&A box. Um, do you wanna leave your share screen up or do you wanna stop it? I'll take my uh, share screen off, thank you. Terrific. So of all of these careers that Chief Justice Jay had, spy master, lawyer, diplomat, governor, uh, Chief Justice, which was his favorite? I got to tell you, um, not, not that there's anything that I can point to where he is quoted as saying my favorite job was this or that, but he always seemed to be wanting to get back to the practice of law. And it seemed to be other things that kept pulling him in other directions. So I would I would have to, it's a speculation on my part, but but I believe it would be the practice of law. Fair enough. Why isn't he better known as a founding father besides the lack of a musical? <laughs> well, um, I think some of the founding fathers are helped historically by whether they achieved uh, any kind of uh, national office. You can go from, from Washington, of course, he'd be in the first tier regardless. Adams, he was a president, he would be in the first tier regardless. Jefferson was a president, he'd be the first tier. You get you get to Madison, you get to Monroe, Hamilton. Um, you know, Jay... Jay never held a national office, and and it seems as if a lot of the history writing of the period is focused on the things that the executive branches were doing and that the legislative branches were doing, and not so much what the courts were doing. The courts were always, you know, that poor sister branch of government off doing its thing, but not in the way that is prominent as, as other. Um, also, one factor might be that when John Jay was in England negotiating the Jay, the Jay Treaty, there's a lot of debate by historians about whether that was a good treaty or a bad treaty for the United States. We won't go into the details here, but when he stepped off the boat, found that he had been elected governor of New York, the terms of those treaties weren't known yet, and they were horribly unpopular at the time with the populace. The Senate kept the terms secret until after the ratification of it by a party line vote. The Federalists had an exact two to one majority in the Senate, so they got it through. But the terms were then leaked to a newspaper in Philadelphia, and that's how the public got to learn what was in it, and they didn't like it. And I, I, got, I have, if I turn on the share screen for just one more second, I have another photograph here of um, a drawing that's a drawing that was published in newspapers of John Jay being burned in effigy because of the unpopularity of the Jay Treaty. Um, he once he is said to have once remarked, although historians have never really been able to verify whether he actually said it, that, that he was so unpopular that he could travel from Boston to Philadelphia at night, lit only by the torches of his burning effigies. But it did keep us out of war until the until the issues were pushed to war in 1812. Yes. Uh, one question about the portrait. Are the colors slightly faded? Uh, one of our viewers noticed that the Harvard crimson should normally be a little bit deeper. Um, I'm the last person to ask that because I have to confess that I'm I'm Green, red, colorblind. I mix up reds and 
greens and browns and grays and blacks and and uh, so I, I I look at that and I I can't answer the question whether the photo is different than the original or whether something is faded. I'm sorry. No, that that's, that's great perfectly, perfectly fair. So um, and I'm not sure either. That's a, a good question for the uh, curatorial types um, out there. So uh, the question about the John Jay estate. Is that a replica? Is the center at the John Jay Estate a replica of the original homestead? No, um, that was a farmhouse that John Jay had purchased in midlife, and uh, he built onto it um, after he had purchased it. Purchased it, and he also acquired through inheritance and otherwise additional parcels of land to increase the size of it. Uh, the property was used as a farm during Jay's retirement years after his time as governor of the state of New York. Uh, interesting story that in the late 1940s, when the United Nations was formed as an organization, they needed a headquarters. And one of the properties that was considered was to use the Jay Homestead as the headquarters of the United Nations. Now, as we know, they... United Nations ultimately went a different direction and they have that nice building on the east side of Manhattan. But all of the traffic problems that are caused in Manhattan anytime there's a big event at the United Nations, those could have been Westchester's if the UN had instead gone to the Jay Homestead. I love that. Um, two more questions and then I will let people get on with their days. One is why John Jay? What inspired you to write this book? Aside from being a lawyer and a judge, which is a natural entree into his life, of course, uh, I do have a very vivid recollection when I was about nine years old, eight, nine years old, of being at the John Jay Homestead with my mother and my brother and my sister. It was a hot summer day. I don't think it had been open all that long before that to the public for touring. And I never would have imagined at that time in life that I would end up doing a study of the man's life and, and writing it up. But I, I do think that that memory um, might have been an influence in deciding to go with this particular project as opposed to some other ideas that I had had. Also, the fact that um, the Butler Library with the repository of material for John Jay was at Columbia University. And, and um, you know I live and work in the greater New York City area, so that was a convenience for this project as well. Excellent. And what are you working on next in your copious non-judging spare time? I'm going to take a little time off from major projects of this kind because I do have a real day job, but uh, I do have um, down the road um, uh, plans to to work up uh, a book on uh, the Dakota Indian War. Uh, Abraham Lincoln had two wars, not just the Civil War. There was a, an Indian War out in Minnesota uh, that distracted him. And the last thing he needed, of course, was to divert resources out to the Midwest to fight that. Uh, the Dakota Indians lost the war. Lots of books on the war. But the story that I'm interested in is what followed. There were um, uh, well over 300 Dakota Indians that were convicted at a military trial, those that had been caught. And virtually all of them that were charged were convicted, but they didn't have lawyers. They didn't understand the language. The due process violations were horrific. So there was a reprieve application to reprieve them all from their death sentences that they were given. And Lincoln being a, a lawyer, uh, while being told don't grant any of these reprieves, the, pu the public doesn't want this. Um, he said, I wanna see the transcripts. So in the, in the middle of the civil war, he's reading the transcripts of these these military trials from Minnesota, and he's shocked by the due process violations, and he pardons all but 38 from the death sentences. The, the 38 that got their death sentence by hanging were individuals where there was evidence that they had killed settlers as opposed to killing soldiers on the battlefield, but um, everybody was telling him not to do this, and the 1864 election was approaching, and he said, and this is what really inspires the book. He said, I will not hang men for votes. I think there's a book there focused not so much on the war, 
but on the, the reprieve process and the interworkings of the White House during that time. That sounds fascinating, and I look forward to reading it when it comes out. That sounds absolutely fascinating. Thank you, Justice Dillon, for joining me today for this fascinating discussion on Chief Justice John Jay. Copies of the first Chief Justice John Jay and the Struggle of, new, of, the new, of a New Nation are available from the Society's Gift Shop at www.supremecourtgifts.org. Uh, copies of Walter Starr's bio of John Jay are also available on our website. The next event in the Society's virtual uh, programs is on April 4th at noon, when we will be hosting a panel conversation, including professors Amanda Tyler, Philip Estrum, along with Joseph Levine, Sharon Frontiero Cohen, and Stephen Weisenfeld on the legal career of Ruth Bader Ginsburg in the 1970s. Registration will soon be open on the Society's website at www.supremecourthistory.org. A reminder that a survey will go out later this afternoon to everyone who registered in advance. Please do respond. We want to make these programs as rich and accessible to as many people as possible. Thank you for joining us. We are adjourned. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you.